Benji, thanks so much for your time. I, I must ask, are you from a, a farming or agricultural uh, background? And is this why this solution uh, stuck out for you? Uh, no, so I'm, I'm actually born and bred in the city. Um, come from more of the data science background, I guess, on the technical side. My partner, James, um, he comes from a farming family up in, in Citrus Del. So that's kind of where the um, old drive and, and agricultural side of things came from. All right, so you used your, uh, your, your data and AI intelligence, and he used his understanding of uh, how farmers are being impacted by uh, pests and disease and how it's destroying their uh, crops. So tell us a little bit about exactly how your solution works. Yeah, sure. So we use aerial imagery, which is essentially from either drones or satellites, to survey a farm. Um, that's capturing different spectra or different bands of light, so it's it's the visual, visual visual data that you can see with the naked eye, and then also infrared imagery that that we can't necessarily see um, physically. And what we do is we process that data using machine learning to try to automatically identify features like pest or disease um, on a tree by tree basis. And what we do with that data is we've built a range of applications that let a, let the farmer use this information and derive um, insights and actions from it. So essentially they can walk into the field with, with these insights and, and manage their farm through better pest or disease management. So that could be walking up to a specific tree, um, which we've identified as a problem tree, and um, applying the right corrective action, whether it be pesticide or, or organic treatment or whatever the farmer wants to, to do. And have you had any, any testimonies from farmers as to how this has worked or helped them? Yeah, so we've been around for about four years, which has been long enough to gather some case studies uh, primarily with farmers in, in South Africa. And we've got a number of cases where we've saved them uh, tens of thousands of rand in, in single orchards, just um, identifying problems early and applying the right corrective action. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, we focus on trees, which are long-term assets. So it's typically 10 to 15 years that it's planted in the ground and being able to find a problem early, it, it will help on that season, but also the upcoming season. Um, so we've got some really good stories with, with farmers around South Africa. Right. And I see that this is not beneficial to uh, farmers only. Banks and insurance companies are finding this uh, useful. Uh, explain to us exactly how. Yeah. So, so while it's, it's clearly useful for the farmer to better manage their risk, um, from the insurance or aggregated um, or, or finance uh, basis, it's obviously useful in that um, the, the corporate could get insights into their farmers or their, their risk portfolio on the ground. So using this data, you could get a sense of um, how your clients are doing, what their risk is like, and, and similarly be able to offer the service to them to inherently become less risky clients and farm better. It's quite similar to a discovery vitality type model where the technology could be used to, to aid the customers to become better clients and at the same time to reduce the risk on the corporate side, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, sure it does. And I'm just interested in, I mean, exactly how has the uptake from your traditional banking and insurance companies been to this uh, digital innovation of yours? How is the partnerships between you guys looking like there? Yeah, so recently it's been really good. Um, we've worked with a number of the, the major financial institutions in South Africa. And over the last year or two, they've really started taking to it in, in the form of uh, pilot projects and, and, and to some point rolling us out to, to the existing clients. Um, Initially, it was slow. I mean, just being a startup and trying to work with a slow-turning corporate wheel is obviously quite difficult. But more recently, uh, the uptake's been really good. And I guess it's quite a competitive space, and the need to innovate is there on the corporate side, and and they're seeing value in this kind of solution. And and as uh, I mean, as a startup, uh, getting a corporate on a board, I mean, you're essentially disrupting their main uh, business uh, model. I mean, how does how does that relationship uh, cement and go ahead uh, stronger? I'm talking specifically about the percentage that these uh, big companies ask uh, to be involved in a project like this. Yeah, so I mean, we've we've managed to avoid things like exclusivity or, or joint ventures wherever possible and pitched ourselves very much as a te technological solution that, that the corporates can use and essentially subscribe to to help make their decisions. Um, so, I mean, we're not trying to compete. We're trying to give a, a solution that can be licensed and help derive better insights, similar to like a credit bureau. Um, and to, to that extent, they've been 
um, great to deal with, to be honest, up until now. And, and we haven't had to fight too much on percentages or that kind of thing. Sure. And I see that you've managed to raise some $2 million in funding from a couple of uh, lenders there that have come on board. Tell us exactly about that and how you're planning to use this money. Yeah, sure. So this is our second round of funding, which we've been lucky enough to raise um, a couple of weeks ago. And it's it's come from a number of great partners, one of them being NetBank, um, which, as mentioned, would help on the financial um, modeling side of things. And there's a couple of companies in the States also who will help us roll out there. And I think that the money is going to be used um, almost half in commercialization. So we've got a product, we've proven the product market fit and taking that um, on the road and, and selling. And the other half will go towards product development in developing these kind of financial products and also just keeping focus on the pharma and building the technology uh, on that side. And I see you are looking to make an entry into the U.S. Uh, what opportunities are you seeing in that market? Yeah, so I, I guess the, the technology that we're building is a software as a service product. So we're not limited geographically. Um, we're more limited technically in terms of the crops that we focus on. And obviously the scale exists in the U.S. and in other markets. And given the crops that we focus on, which are mainly citrus and nuts, it's, it's a big opportunity for us. So... At the moment, two of our team, uh, Andrew and Tim, are on the ground in the States and um, looking to form some partnerships with some of the major agri companies on that side and get some, some clients signed up. Uh, Benji, what about Africa? I mean, many of the countries on uh, this continent are quite big in the agricultural uh, space. How could this help them accelerate uh, their agricultural, the growth rather, in the agricultural sector? Yeah, so... I mean, there's obviously a lot of opportunity in Africa, given given the agricultural space, um, and and this kind of technology essentially helps farmers become more efficient and and optimize their operations. But to be honest, it's it's mainly been focused at large scale commercial farmers at the moment and focused on high value crops, um, like I said, citrus and nuts, and those do exist in Africa, in places like South Africa, Kenya, um, etc. And those are the markets that we're breaking to, into at the moment, and. Hopefully, longer term, we can start looking at smallholder farmers through the support of the financial institutions, which could potentially help subsidize the cost of the technology. But at the moment, um, partially because of the cost and also just the lack of infrastructure in internet mm. connectivity um, and access to technology, Africa hasn't really been a primary uh, focus for us. Uh, it's been more places like the States, South America, Australia, um, and those kind of markets for now. And uh, Benji, you said this is the second round of funding in which you raised two uh, million dollars. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in that because many startups say raising funding is the most difficult part about getting going. What was the experience like uh, for you and perhaps the tips for other startups looking to inject a bit of juice in their business? Yeah, so, so to be honest, the first round of funding we raised about a year and a half ago from um, two venture capital funds, one in South Africa, 4DI, and a fund out of Tanzania, the Savannah Fund. And that was extremely difficult. It took us about uh, a year to close that round of funding. And I mean, at that stage, we were already a two-year-old business. We had a product which we thought was one of the best in the world and a really great team. And um, it, it was difficult. I think the South African VC space specifically is, is quite traditional. It's people from uh, private equity and asset management backgrounds who don't necessarily understand venture capital in, in finding a, a great team with a good idea and a good product. And um, I, I mean, I guess the, the lessons we learned along that journey was just to maintain our integrity and kind of stick to what we believed in and and keep selling what, what we were really selling. And what I'm trying to say is along the way, we kind of picked up what investors did and didn't want to hear. And I mean, it's quite easy to sort of sell yourself short and, and just, just in the objective of raising funding. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's changing. Like, we're starting to see subsequently quite a lot of venture capital come into South Africa. And luckily, the second round, which we raised now, is quite a lot uh, easier. Well, uh, thanks so much for those tips. And uh, best of luck in your growth. That was Benji Maltzer, who's a CTO and co-founder of AI company Aerobotics.